Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Thanks everyone for having me back. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. We kind of teased this a little bit a few weeks ago when we talked about fentanyl and the other high-potency synthetic opioids, and we'd had a little discussion on how some folks where illicitly manufactured fentanyl is their drug of choice are having difficulties with traditional buprenorphine inductions. So as promised, we'll talk about that population as well as several others who might benefit from an alternate induction approach. There's a lot of different names out there. People call this different things. You know, microdosing is often used. It's, I think, falling out of favor because it's not quite accurate. Low dose initiation seems to be the new preferred nomenclature at this point. You also hear it referred to as the Bernese method, referencing an early study out of Switzerland that we'll actually take a quick look at here. But I think low dose initiation or microdosing is what you'll most commonly see. I don't have any disclosures. So we'll have a brief refresher on buprenorphine pharmacology and and why you might consider microdosing inductions. What populations or what type of patient you might consider it for, you know, and these are traditionally folks that might run into problems with the standard induction. A little more about behind why microdosing might work and some of the evidence, and then I'll show you a sample approach. There's lots of approaches out there, and I'll show you the one that I use. So a brief disclaimer, microdosing is not an FDA-approved use of buprenorphine naloxone, and the literature thus far is pretty limited, limited to case reports, case series, and then just recently there's been two larger retrospective cohort studies that we'll look at, both in the inpatient setting, and there's no evidence-based protocols, but there's accumulating clinical experience and excitement, and there are some randomized controlled trials that are recruiting or at some part along the process of being published and comparing traditional inductions to microdosing inductions. So just to jump right in and talk about the pharmacology of buprenorphine, if you look at this graph here, we have the dose on the x-axis and the effects at the mu opioid receptor on the y-axis. This is a good way to think about kind of different classes of medications or or substances that affect the mu receptor. And for your full agonists, like most of them, heroin, morphine, methadone, etc., as you increase the dose, the effect, the activation of the mu opioid receptors in the central nervous system increases and you get all your opioidergic effects, analgesia, euphoria, and up here, dangerous respiratory depression. With your antagonists like naloxone or naltrexone, a high affinity competitive antagonists, and they don't activate the receptor at all. They just block it and displace other opioids that are on it and block other opioids from acting on it. But your partial agonists like buprenorphine has a ceiling effect, at least in the area of respiratory depression. And as you increase the dose, uh, lower doses, the mu effect increases, but it eventually tapers off and you don't reach these higher levels where we see problematic respiratory depression, which is one of the reasons it's so much safer than a full agonist. So these kind of unique pharmacologic properties of buprenorphine are part of what makes it such a good medicine in the treatment of opioid use disorder. It's a partial activist, so you're not sedated from its use, but at the same time, it suppresses withdrawal. It has a high affinity, so it can block some of the reinforcing effects of other opioids if a patient were to lapse when taken at therapeutic doses. And it has a slow dissociation from that receptor, so you don't have to redose continually, and it has a long um, duration of action. But these same pharmacologic properties make it a little bit challenging to start uh, the medication. And if you have a full agonist on board, like heroin or methadone or morphine or oxycodone, activating your mu receptor system and you take buprenorphine, you're going to displace that full agonist. You'll have a net reduction in your mu opioid activation. And the the patient experiences that as a particularly uncomfortable withdrawal because it all kind of happens at once, this kind of precipitated withdrawal. And most of the steps we take in inductions are to avoid this complication. 
a traditional induction, as you guys may know, varies from clinic to clinic, but in general, you want to wait 8 to 12 hours from last use of a short-acting opioid until in mild to moderate withdrawal. Traditionally, you'll take 2 to 4 milligrams as the first dose and repeat this dosing every couple hours until you get to 12 to 16 milligrams total daily dose or whatever dose your symptoms are controlled. We used to do a lot of in-office inductions, but there's a lot of evidence now and experience with home inductions that can be equally safe and efficacious and more convenient for the patient and the clinic. But there are certain populations that may have trouble with these traditional inductions. One is patients on methadone. Another population is patients with chronic pain who are on opioids for pain. And the other is patients using fentanyl. And the broader category is anyone who's had trouble with a standard induction in the past. As Hillary mentioned before we started, it's, it's not uncommon to have patients with an opioid use disorder when you're discussing treatment to kind of write off buprenorphine and say, well, I have an allergy to that or I can't take that medication. I tried it and uh, it made me really sick. In all likelihood, what's happening is they may have taken it inappropriately or too early or had a precipitated withdrawal event that could hopefully be avoided the next time around and still allow them access to a really good treatment for opioid use disorder. So just taking these populations one by one, patients on methadone, it's hard to get from high doses of methadone that you see in methadone maintenance over to buprenorphine by traditional inductions. SAMHSA's TIP-63, their kind of Bible for opioid use disorder medications, recommends tapering down to 30 or 40 milligrams of methadone per day and being on that dose for about a week before even starting the process of transitioning. And for folks who are on 120, 150 milligrams of methadone, that process can take weeks to months and be very uncomfortable and be predisposed to a relapse. Once you've been at that dose for a week, you're going to need to abstain from methadone for anywhere from 24 to 48, honestly 72 hours. In some cases, it's got a very long and variable half-life before initiating buprenorphine. So pretty challenging. Patients with pain, patients who have been maintained on um, opioid analgesics for chronic pain for a long time, they may have less experience self-managing symptoms of withdrawal compared to patients with OUD and may have real fears and anxieties around experiencing symptoms of withdrawal. And this could be a pretty substantial barrier to rotating buprenorphine in folks who you're having that conversation with for safety reasons. Likewise, patients who are hospitalized with acute pain, it might be a tough sell to go 8 to 12 hours without an opioid analgesic to get on this medicine when they're still needing medications for acute pain. So this is another population where the traditional induction might be difficult. And then we'll spend a little more time talking about illicitly manufactured fentanyl, which is the prevalent opioid that's available in the illicit market in much of the country now. Though pharmacokinetic studies of fentanyl report half-lives in the several hour range, this is really in the acute administration period. So patients in the PACU, when the fentanyl gets turned off, they clear it pretty quick. But because of its lipophilicity, chronic use means it gets sequestered in the adipocytes, very similar to THC. So if someone's chronically using fentanyl, the clearance is kind of a different story, and it can re-equilibrate with the uh, serum and hang around a lot longer. This is a qualitative study interviewing with some people who used fentanyl and had had real trouble starting buprenorphine. And Here's a patient or a participant who described being in withdrawal for 72 hours and taking a buprenorphine and then describing in vivid detail pretty severe precipitated withdrawal. Here's another patient who said, buprenorphine sends me into precipitated withdrawals every time I try to get off fentanyl. I have these sub doctors telling me that it's not real and it's like, go ask the people who are buying it off the street. It's real. I waited 80 hours. I was in a detox, and after 80 hours, they gave me a Suboxone, and it still put me into precipitated. And another thing I like about this quote is I think it highlights that this is, at least a couple years ago, was not really well understood or appreciated by the medical community that that this was going on. This is a kind of an interesting study. This was a study looking at sleep medication as an adjunctive treatment for opioid use disorder, and 
Buprenorphine induction was thought to be part of the study protocol as a low-risk procedure, but they had two patients, their first two patients, who endorsed fentanyl as their drug of choice, and they precipitated withdrawal using the standard induction protocol. You can see here that they were actually asked to abstain from opioids for 24 hours. They waited until their cow score was above 8, and they gave 4 milligrams of buprenorphine, and, and they precipitated withdrawal in both cases. These bottom cases show how they modified their protocol. They required a longer period of abstinence, 48 hours, and they gave smaller doses of buprenorphine over a longer period of time, and they were able to induct those patients onto buprenorphine. Another study, they just took people who were admitted to a 28-day residential program where fentanyl was the drug of choice, and they tested them every day in the urine every day for fentanyl and norfentanyl. They found the clearance for fentanyl was over seven days, and the mean time for clearance of norfentanyl was almost two weeks. And norfentanyl, the major metabolite of fentanyl, active metabolite, and that's compared to about two to four days clearance of any metabolites for most short-acting opioids. So there is this persistence in the system. This slide just serves as a reminder that fentanyl use and overdose is, um, the East Coast has been dealing with it for a long time, but the fentanyl era has arrived in the West Coast as well, unfortunately. So in addition to all these increases in overdose, we're going to have to learn new approaches to inductions for folks who have trouble. The idea behind microdosing is basically that if you can gradually introduce low doses of suboxone into the system, uh, buprenorphine, sorry, into the system, you can gradually displace the full opioid and get people on buprenorphine without the withdrawal washout period. And this is supposed to demonstrate that graphically. You've got your full opioid here occupying the receptor. If you take a big dose of buprenorphine all at once, you displace that full opioid, your mu activation goes down and you get sick. Whereas if over several days you gradually introduce higher and higher doses of buprenorphine, you can fully occupy those receptors with the buprenorphine, but avoid withdrawal and avoid risk of precipitating withdrawal. I want to just spend a couple minutes to show this paper that out of Bern, Switzerland, that was the first to kind of describe some of these outcomes with microdosing. And this was a patient who was using heroin and they had pretty complicated up titration strategy of buprenorphine and they were successfully able to get them onto buprenorphine. And then a second patient who was actually on heroin assisted treatment, which is legal in Switzerland. This dotted line is their full agonist, the diacetyl morphine or heroin, and this line is the dose of buprenorphine. And they gradually up titrated over a month and came down on the dose of diacetyl morphine, and the patient didn't experience significant withdrawal, which is represented in this solid line here. So what's, what's the evidence? There was a recent systemic review from 2020 that kind of collated these case reports that totaled 63 patient experiences in 20 publications. This was in both ambulatory and hospital settings, and there were a variety of approaches described from transitioning from different opioids, from different doses with varying amounts. Most of the initial doses ranged from 0.2 to 0.5 milligrams of buprenorphine. And most of the protocols also up titrated over a period of four to eight days to a target dose of eight to 16 milligrams. Since that was published, there's been these two larger retrospective inpatient studies, one out of OHSU, and that had 72 patients enrolled and they showed the reason why they chose to do a uh, microdosing induction. A lot of it had to do with co-occurring pain in the inpatient setting, but some had anxiety around experiencing withdrawal. They were transitioning from high dose of methadone or they'd had a history of precipitated withdrawal. And 18%, 13 of the patients had to discontinue uh, microdosing induction, but the rest, the vast majority, 70% completed that microdosing induction in the hospital, and 12% were scheduled to complete it as an outpatient. Of those 13 who discontinued, one had been transferred to comfort care, one had side effects that they attributed to buprenorphine, five had fear of inadequate pain control, and two uh, ended up deciding to go with methadone for treatment. And the last study I want to look at is by our, some of our colleagues here at Harborview in Seattle. 
which was a retrospective uh, cohort study of 62 patients who underwent uh, low-dose initiations. And they've done this bivariate analysis stratification here, who was successful in it, which was the majority, 51 out of the 62, and who was unsuccessful and what patient characteristics might have significant correlation with that outcome. And the ones that did were age. If you were younger, you were more likely to be successful. The reason for transitioning, and you can see here that folks who transitioned because of dispo reasons were much more likely to be unsuccessful compared to folks who transitioned because it was the patient's preference. That kind of makes sense. I think it speaks to motivation to complete the process. And then if whether or not they had withdrawal during the process, folks who had any withdrawal were uh, more likely to be unsuccessful than folks who didn't. Just want to show the protocol they used because I know there's a lot of interest in what the dosing protocol actually is, and we'll get into a couple others in a minute. But it's uh, pretty similar to a lot of the outpatient protocols that are used in some of those other case series. Overall, 82% of patients in this study successfully transitioned to buprenorphine. About 40% endorsed withdrawal symptoms, most of which were minor and included anxiety, diaphoresis, and headache. And uh, two-thirds of these patients followed up within a month for continued treatment within our health system at discharge. So with the remaining time, I'd like to talk about actually how to do this and how to approach the patient. The major caveat here is that these are pretty complicated regimens. And to do this in the outpatient setting, the patient really does have to be motivated and pretty organized or have a lot of support. For patients who are wishing to transition from methadone maintenance, I think it would be wise to discuss this plan with their opiate treatment program provider and see if this is a transition that uh, makes sense and see if the opioid treatment program may be able to provide a structured transition in their setting. It may be wise in these early days to not make a transition directly from super high doses of methadone. At the Evergreen Treatment Services Opioid Treatment Program here in Seattle, we generally try to get people to around 80 milligrams before making this transition. And then most important, you want to provide plenty of supports, regular visits or phone check-ins to make sure they're able to adhere and understand the instructions. Can the pharmacy provide blister packs? There was a published study that showed they were able to partner with a pharmacy to do that. We're in discussions with some of our pharmacies, but we haven't yet been able to provide blister packs for patients. Or can they get their dosing observed through an OTP? This is an example um, schedule that's the one I most typically use. They all have their benefits and drawbacks, and they're all pretty complicated. This is pretty similar. It actually might be the same that the um, Seattle King County Public Health Clinics use for microinductions. But, you know, you start with a quarter of a two milligram film a day and then a quarter of a film twice a day and you gradually increase BID dosing and TID dosing. So it's pretty complicated in that regard and takes a long time to go through with the patient and a lot of handholding and support to get through this. The easy part is the full agonist opioid. That stays the same. You can, if they prefer to kind of taper along as they're going, they can, but typically you'd want to keep that dose the same and then stop when they've reached a therapeutic dose, 12 to 16 milligrams of buprenorphine. Because at that point, the buprenorphine is probably occupying the vast majority of receptors. Just wanted to share this. This is a protocol we're working on at Evergreen Treatment Services where we can hopefully administer both methadone and buprenorphine at the window for patients. So it's only once a day dosing, kind of gradual increase over the course of two weeks to transition folks from high doses of methadone to buprenorphine. And we've started doing this with a handful of patients, but don't yet have a lot of experience. I think we've done it with about 14 patients so far with pretty good success. Though patients do describe some kind of subacute withdrawal over this period. Another thing I'd stress is it's okay to be flexible and if a patient wants to take longer, you can take longer and kind of take slower steps. There is the uh, transdermal buprenorphine, which is FDA approved for pain. Pharmacologically is a good way to kind of gradually introduce low levels of buprenorphine in the system. Some protocols involve its use in the first two days before getting on to sublingual and it kind of avoids that whole scenario where you're cutting films 
but the cost of that medication and the fact that it's not FDA approved for opioid use disorder kind of limits its use in a lot of settings. If the patient misses a dose during the induction, probably want to just repeat the previous dose and then basically pick up where you left off. If you've missed two or more, you might want to go back or consider restarting. And not generally necessary, but symptomatic management with adjunctive agents, clonidine, tizanidine, loperamide, NSAIDs, and hydroxyzine can make it a little more comfortable for folks, that minority of folks that do have bothersome withdrawal symptoms during this transition period. To summarize, you can initiate buprenorphine without this kind of washout period that's built into traditional inductions. It may be a good option for folks transitioning from methadone, folks with co-occurring pain, or, or folks who are using illicitly manufactured fentanyl. There's no evidence-based protocols. Plans should be flexible and individualized, and uh, dosing regimens can be complicated, so patients need to have support to be successful. Here are my references, and um, I know we have cases to get to, but I'm happy to take any questions or have a discussion if there's time. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off. Thank you.